in ayurveda there is the concept of agni or digestive fire that follows a certain pattern during the course of a 24 hour period in traditional chinese medicine there is a concept of an organ clock where different organs reach their peak efficiency at specific times during a 24 hour period india and china make up one third of humanity and 2000 years ago, they made up half of the world's population. So it is quite remarkable that the ideas around what is the best time during the day to do various things, eat, sleep, think, or be physically active are surprisingly similar. And if you ignore the why and focus on the what, modern day science actually agrees with the broad recommendations made thousands of years ago. Welcome to the science of the circadian rhythm, also known as the body clock. As with most subjects in biology, it's extremely complicated. But the beauty of biology is that you can choose to understand it at whatever level that is practically useful to you. A researcher on hormones is going to look at the subject at a molecular level of complexity that will require decades of study. We are going to stick to what do I need to know to make smart choices about my health level of understanding. Let's start with definitions. At its most basic level, the circadian rhythm is like a 24-hour internal clock in your body that helps control your sleep-wake cycle. It tells you when to wake up, when to feel sleepy, and when to be alert. This rhythm is influenced by natural things like daylight and darkness. The circadian rhythm, named after circa, meaning around, and diem, meaning day in Latin, evolved as a way for organisms to adapt to the Earth's 24-hour day-night cycle. Life on Earth evolved under the influence of the sun's regular pattern of light and darkness. So developing an internal clock that matched this cycle provided a survival advantage over the last several billion years. This rhythm helps organisms anticipate and prepare for regular environmental changes such as finding food during the day and resting at night. Fun fact, even your gut bacteria have a circadian rhythm and it's typically in sync with yours. The circadian rhythm involves a bunch of hormones whose production increases and decreases during a 24-hour period. These hormones affect not just sleep but also hunger, stress, alertness and body temperature. On that note, let's start with melatonin. It is the hormone that tells you it's time to sleep. When it gets dark, your brain's pineal gland starts producing melatonin, making you feel drowsy. This hormone's production is closely tied to your exposure to light. Typically, the daytime sun has more blue light and the evening sun has more red light. So as you can imagine, blue light reduces the production of melatonin and red light increases it. That's why it's harder to sleep after scrolling through your phone while lying on your bed at night because they will put out a lot of blue light. Modern day devices can switch to a more yellow red tinged night mode of display but remember more exposure to light after sunset is going to affect your sleep. This includes electric lights in your home. So melatonin levels rise in the evening, peak in the middle of the night and drop by morning helping you wake up feeling refreshed. Remember this graph we will get back to it. After sleep, there is hunger. And two hormones control this, ghrelin and leptin. Ghrelin levels increase to let you know that it's time to eat. If you maintain a regular eating schedule, the levels of this hormone will go up just around the time you normally eat. And leptin is produced when it's time to stop eating. This is the satiety signaling hormone. A diet rich in refined carbohydrates and sugars makes your body less sensitive to leptin, meaning that your brain won't receive enough signals from your body that you have eaten enough. So this is why we tend to overconsume carbohydrates quite easily. On the other hand, protein, fiber and certain fats are good for leptin sensitivity. So you feel full sooner and that's a good thing. Once you've eaten, we get to metabolism. And that is the job of the one hormone every Indian 
is aware of insulin. You can watch my earlier video on the basics of metabolism that explains exactly how insulin works. In short, insulin helps cells absorb glucose from your blood and either use it up, turn it into glycogen for later use or convert it to fat. During the day, your body is more sensitive to insulin, helping to keep your blood sugar level stable after meals. At night, insulin sensitivity drops, which means that your body is not as effective at lowering blood sugar levels. Eating a big carbohydrate heavy meal late at night can leave you with higher blood sugar levels for longer, increasing the risk of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes over time. As part of your circadian rhythm, insulin sensitivity is higher during the day and lower as you get towards evening and night. Again, remember this graph, we will get back to it. So you've slept, woken up, eaten and digested food. The next thing is alertness and the hormone that controls this is cortisol. Cortisol levels are highest in the early morning shortly after waking up. This peak helps promote alertness and readiness for the day ahead and its levels gradually decrease throughout the day, reaching their lowest point in the late evening and early part of the night. And the levels start to go up through the night and then peak when it's time to wake up. The last element of your circadian rhythm is body temperature. It rises during the day, helping you feel alert and energetic since high core temperature improves your metabolism and falls at night, preparing you for sleep. This temperature fluctuation can impact your physical performance and even your mood. So now let's put it all together into a simple science and ancient tradition backed guide to how to get the best out of your circadian rhythm. Early morning, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Melatonin levels are low, cortisol levels are high. Blood sugar will be low because you haven't eaten all night. So wake up, but do light but not super challenging cognitive tasks because you might not have the blood sugar your brain needs. Then breakfast, which will increase insulin and bring your blood sugar back to normal, but now you have the perfect conditions. High cortisol and high energy for cognitively challenging work from 8 to 12 noon. Now any light exercise or movement during this time will also help release endorphins which also improve your mood and energy. So it's a bonus. Then lunch. Post lunch, 12 to 3 p.m. Again, insulin is produced to deal with blood sugar. Cortisol levels start to fall and melatonin levels start to rise later in the afternoon. So this is not ideal for highly cognitively challenging work. This is why post lunch meetings are usually unproductive. Plus carbohydrate heavy Indian meals also cause a sugar spike and crash, which makes your brain think you don't have energy. Then we get to late afternoon, early evening, 3 to 6 p.m. Now your body temperature is high, which improves physical performance. So this is the best time to hit the gym. Unfortunately, our work schedules might not allow this. And finally, 6 to 9 p.m. sunset, melatonin levels go up, cortisol levels are low, so it's time for relaxation. Also, since insulin sensitivity goes down in the evening, it's best to avoid high carbohydrate meals for dinner. Either eat light or eat more protein and fiber. Reduce exposure to smartphone, tablet, laptop and TV screens and prepare for sleep. Again, these are ideal state average scenarios. Most of us have busy, unpredictable lives that involve travel across time zones, night shift work, babies that keep you awake at night and many other factors. But the point of the guide is to give you a rough sense for what is likely to be the best way to be in tune with your biological clock. A common comment I get on my videos is that, hey, this is exactly what our ancestors told us and now science is beginning to catch up. But I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Traditional bodies of knowledge have always captured the what very well because they've had the advantage of time. 
And it is not surprising that day-to-day -day habits of when to eat, when to sleep, or when to be physically active are often best captured over really long-term observations. Evidence-based medicine or science focuses on the why. And it is about 200 years old, and most modern research techniques work better for short-term effects than really long-term ones. A single researcher cannot study a phenomenon for more than a few decades. Civilization's goal should be to go from what to why over time. Ayurveda might say, eat dinner around sunset. And that's really good what advice. But then it will say, it's Agni that determines when and what to eat. That's a why. But cellular and molecular biology tells us that it's ghrelin, leptin, insulin, melatonin, and cortisol in a delicate dance. So it's okay to appreciate the Ayurvedic what and the scientific why.